asking me about some of the topics, how do you convert your mate, uh, what about my family, um, how to close a study. All those lessons are on that USB drive. What I want to do in the remaining two sessions is give you what is the most practical things that, you know, I want to give you operational details of what it looks like as you, as you experience evangelism. Um, and so let's go ahead and go back to the model. And so, again, this is, it's, it's, it's contact heavy because without contacts, you just don't go anywhere. And um, so I had a preacher uh, send a report in yesterday, and he said, Rob, he says, you know, we have everything set up. Everything's working well. He said, we have trained the members. We have one problem. We have no contacts. Well, if you have no contacts, nothing else matters. So, so we've looked at door knocking, and uh, we've, we've talked about the training that's involved. Um, the sermon that we give you is called When Jesus Went Door Knocking, Matthew chapter 10. What are the lessons we learned when Jesus sent out the limited commission, what did he tell him to do? So there's your lesson, and uh, we're going to, again, preach a sermon. Uh, is everyone going to knock doors? No. Do you want everybody knocking doors? No. Do you need a, a group of people to knock doors? Yes, right? And so we got to train that group of people. We make the congregation aware of it, but then we select a few people, and then we put them in that team, and we move on. This is a pretty exciting um, uh, this is a new uh, tool in our school, and let me talk a little bit about how to do it. Um, so when I was in uh, Lake City, Florida, T.J. Gifford came up to me, and he said, Rob, can I share something with you that works for us? I said, yes. He said, we uh, invented uh, or, or printed out some invitation cards. They're personal invitation cards. On the back side, actually, it says, invited by services we offer. He says, we ask our members to hand these to people each month. I said, man, I love that. I said, is it working? He says, we're baptizing people. I said, okay. So I took it back to Glencoe, and we, we printed up our, the cards, and uh, we passed them out in bundles of 10. We gave everybody a bundle. We preached a sermon that's associated with it. There's actually a training card. There's a sermon. And, uh, and then we say, okay, go hand them out. So you go to the restaurant, and you hand it to your, 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 your waitress. You go to the bank, and Miss Karen Drenner, 77 years old, puts it in her deposit slip, and she hands it to her bank teller. On Sunday morning, Miss Karen Drenner is in the foyer, and she, her eyes lit up. And she says, hey, 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 Rob, that's that bank teller. That's that bank teller. She was so excited. And so I said, well, Karen, ask her to sit with you. And she did. And that bank teller sat with Karen Drenner. And, um, and so it was, it, was, it, was, it was amazing. And as she's sitting there, you know, of course, the preacher immediately went into, you know, the, 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 the visitor mode. We had our, our team sitting there. And we invited her to lunch. We got to know her. And, um, and then we did the Bible study and we baptized her. I can tell you when Karen Drenner was sitting there watching that baptism, you know, tears are they're just dripping out of her eyes. Because without Karen Drenner, there's no baptism. Then we studied with the daughter. Okay, we just baptized her uh, a couple of weeks ago. Maybe two weeks ago we baptized the daughter. All from an invitation card. Now, let me give you a few details about this card. If you order invitation cards, and we print them for you, all right, we, we, are buy, we, are, we are quickly trying to replace the printing companies. We are trying to get everything in-house so we can make it as cheap as possible, and we're buying big machines to do things like this. So, <clears throat> so when you order yours, it's customized. You get your, your, your card. Now, when you preach the lesson, you've got to hand out the cards in bundles, either 10, 20, and you give an assignment. Everybody needs to pass 10 of them out a month. If you go put them on your evangelism table and that's the end of it, it only works one time because they will not pick them up. They're not going to get them. Every month, you've got to pass them out in bundles of 10 so you have a coordinator who gets in front of the church and says, hey, it's, it's April, it's time to get everybody their invitation cards and, and, and we pass them out. If you are not intentional, if you're not that deliberate, it will not work. All right, if you just say, oh, they're on the table, pick them up as you go out of the church. How many people do you think are going to pick them up? How many? No one's going to pick them up. They're not going to get them. All right, so again, being intentional, training, invitation cards, provide more contact. So let's just do some math. You have 100 members, and every member is given 10 cards. 10 cards per 100 members gives you how many invitations in a month? 1,000. A thousand times twelve months gives you how many invitations? Twelve thousand. Those twelve thousand invitation cards will produce how many contacts? I don't know yet. It's too early. It's too early, but I'm going to suspect we might get a hundred contacts out of those twelve thousand invitation cards. 
All right, so you add that to your list, right? You add it to the list. Is the invitation card by itself going to cause your church to grow? No. With the invitation card, the door knocking, the new mover, house to house, heart to heart, the bookmark. Y'all see what we're doing? It's, a, it's like we've said, it's a few. You get a few in each of these. So we just keep adding. We keep adding. And so now we train. Now we go. So how many things can we add? Well, you tell me. You tell me how many things we can add. All right. So, so all of these things are contact creators. We have 21 of them on the website, but you have others. The point is, everything you do should be about contacts. So if it's feeding the community, a community meal, it's contacts, right? If it's a backpack drive, it's contacts. It really doesn't matter what it is. It's all about contacts. It never stops being about contacts. So if you're, you're in a church and they're not focused on contacts, brother, then you're missing the boat. You're missing out. Now, once we establish contacts, what do we do? Of course, there's a training card. <laughs> we go to prospects. Now, now the system begins working. We're going to prospect those contacts. How? Compassion cards. We're going to divide the church up. Now, if you're a church of 850, um, you're going to have to really think carefully about how you do this. All right? Um, but if you're a church of 200, 300, this isn't hard. So if, I had, we, if there were 300 members, I'd say eight groups. All right? And you, and you, and you don't do sign-up lists. Why don't you do sign-up lists? Because the same people sign up every time. The elders make the list. The elders assign the groups. So the elders say, you're a group leader for one, you're a group leader for two, you're a group leader for three. So if you've got eight teams, that's every other month you're doing it one time. I mean, we can, <laughs> we're, we're talking minimal effort here. So, or six groups or whatever, you know. How many groups do y'all have at Hatton, Chris? Four, four groups at Hatton. Okay, y'all about 200 or so. Yeah, so about four, four, four groups. So again, you, you, you put the members into a group and uh, you have group leaders and you have to train the group how to do this. All right, the card should already be set up before they get there. You should not allow people to select their own cards. That is a mistake. The cards are already pre-selected by maybe a ladies or group of ladies that come up on a Thursday or Friday. They set them out. They have piles. All you do is sit down and write your cards, right? And you start mailing them uh, by putting them in the basket. We don't even let you mail. We're, we're going to stamp it. We're going to return address it. All you got to do is write a personal note. Now, there is actually a card that you can preach. And we actually have a sermon from uh, Adam Fawn. Uh, Adam is a great guy. And he did a sermon from the book of Proverbs on how to write a card. What do you say in a card? It's really good. So this right here, very effective when it's done right. Now, if you've got 10 contacts on a list, okay, you've got 10, 10 contacts, you can easily go through 100 cards in a week easily, all right? So this is, this is where um, elders need to understand. It's a budget item, all right? This right here is, a, this is, going, to be a, this is going to consume some resources. And so you're, you're sending these cards out. There are ways to save a little money. For example, you can put two cards in an envelope and cut your postage in half. You can put three cards in an envelope and cut it by a third, um, you can go to eBay and get forever stamps that were purchased by a company three years ago when stamps were 48, 50 cents or whatever it was and pay, pay for those stamps and save money. There are some economic things you can do, but the fact is, if you think you're going to save money by doing one card and 20 people signing it, it won't work. Okay, you lose the effect. You want that person receiving multiple cards a day for a period of, we used to say six weeks, then we dialed it down to four, we still got the same results. We dialed it down to three, same results. We're at three weeks now. For three weeks, 15 days, they get cards, constant cards from your church. And, our, and that gives you a pretty good, a pretty good. So go to, verse, uh, go to the book of Jude and you'll notice there's a verse here that I love, I love to read. And uh, because this is, this is uh, I think, a good application of this passage. Book of Jude, um, look at verse number 22. And on some have compassion, making a difference. So that's why we call them compassion cards. We're trying to be difference makers. We want them to realize we love them. We, we want them to be part of the church. Um, notice verse 23, and others save with fear. Some people are only going to be reached um, when they about lose their life or from a hellfire and brimstone sermon. That's the only time you're going to get them. But there's a lot of people that can be saved with compassion and love and kindness. And that's what prospecting is all about. And so that prospecting step there is designed to till the soil. Every farmer tills the soil before he plants. Every gardener does that. 
the gold miner prospects the pay dirt and tries to separate out what produces from what doesn't produce. And so we're trying to do the same with all those contacts. We're trying to figure out which one produces and which one does not produce. So that is a very important part of the process. Um, Compassion cards are good because every member is involved in it. It's not just about one person. It's about everyone. And so we're going to get skin in the game. Older people, younger people. We have cards for children. Uh, we have cards for like four-year-olds, like dot to dot, color by number. And, and I can tell you that children's cards are very important. Uh, when people receive them, it moves them. Compassion cards, very important part of the tool. A lot of, a lot of good done. So what do compassion cards do? When I walk into a house and they got 70 cards sitting there, how hard do you think is it for me to engage that person? Not hard. It's, 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 it becomes very, very, uh, um, uh, um, it's, 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 more, it's, it's, it's a whole lot easier for me to transition to a Bible study when they're gushing with love than it is from a cold doorknob. So that right there is the purpose of the card. So, um, by the way, if you go to, uh, Caleb, could you bring up a website for me? Uh, it's um, handyworksbyhanna.com. It's H-A-N-D-I, handyworksbyhanna.com. I'll pull up the website, and I'll show you kind of what it looks like. Um, and so there, there are 13 categories, I think. I think it's 13. We have 130 different designs. They are, for full disclosure, designed by my daughter, Hannah, and uh, so what Hannah does is she um, takes pictures as we travel. She creates the cards. Why do we do that? Because there is no life way anymore. There is no, you know, gospel advocate. Um, they're, they're, just, they're just not long for us. I, I wish they were, but these companies are not going to make it. All right. And so people have a hard time finding cards. And uh, um, I, I, it's, it's uh, you know, if you can get your cards uh, at a local bookstore, Mars Hill is a good example. It's just not with, I wish it was, it's just not here. So how are we going to, how are we going to get cards? Well, Hannah says, Dad, I'll design them. I'll make them myself. I had no idea when she started this, we'd be going through about 20,000 cards a, a month. And we'd be printing them, you know, 300,000 at a time. But that's what's going on. She is the hallmark of the brotherhood. So it's compassion cards. And uh, maybe I gave you the wrong website, Caleb. Uh, handyworksbyhanna.com. I think that's the right website. And it uh, should be a card website that pulls up. And uh, I think Caleb's trying to find it. When he does, he'll put it on the screen for us. But I just wanted to give you access to that. Um, uh, we're, we're, um, we're currently trying to design a, um, uh, a uh, box. For, for, we have a company where you can actually uh, organize them. And, uh, and that's going to be next. So let me go on to the next one here. Well, I think Caleb's still trying to bring that up. Um, any questions about cards, by the way? Do y'all do, do card ministries at, at churches? Most of our card ministries focus on members, right? And that's why it's not effective as an evangelism tool. Um, we need to focus on the people in our community that have cancer, that lost loved ones, people that are really struggling. And they receive those cards. I promise the next time your preacher knocks on the door, it's going to be pleasantly, it's going to be a very pleasant experience. We have more, um, more movement, more results with this and almost anything else we do in our school. And it gets everyone involved. Um, <clears throat> Caleb, if you can't find it, it's okay. I may have missed, uh, miss, uh, I may have miss, uh, remembered. It is. It's on the training card. Okay, I just wanted to make sure everybody had access to it. That training card, again, does give you access to it, and it provides uh, some teaching material and, um, and uh, in the compassion or in the prospecting step. All right. I think he just about has it. All right. There we go. Handy work. Is that what it was? Okay. And uh, I think he just about pulled it up there. I think I see it down there. It's, I thought it has a, maybe not, maybe a handy work by Hannah. Is that it? Yeah. Very good. There we go. All right, there it is. There are the categories on top, and you can see right there, Get Well, Kids Corner, New Convert, New Mover, 
So where are you going to buy a new mover car? You're not. All right, so praying for you, restoration, sympathy, thank you, thinking of you, visitors, and all these cards. Now, they're designed again where you can put up the three cards in an envelope and still be under the one-ounce rule. So if you need to save a little money on postage, that will work. And, um, and there's an envelope, of course, that comes with them. And uh, you, want, you don't want to write a book. <laughs> all you got to do is write two or three sentences and just let them know you're praying for them. Let them know that you're thinking about them. Um, and uh, those of you who are excellent at writing cards maybe can help those who are not, uh, but uh, they are very, very effective. Can you click on one of those for us, Caleb, and just bring it up and just click on any of them? There you go. We'll just bring one of them up, and um, <clears throat> that way you can see a little bigger rendition of it. And when a congregation, <clears throat> when a congregation actually gets involved in this, um, like I said, you're going to go through quite a few cards. Congregations do get a discount that are enrolled in the school. So that's the individual pricing. But the congregation gets them a little cheaper than that. And um, <clears throat> so you can go through it and, and select whatever, whatever card it is you need. All right, let's just go back to the PowerPoint, Caleb. All right, let's go to the next one. Here it is, eating. Take people out to eat. I've, I've said that before. That is a prospecting uh, step. Um, uh, the first time I met Jonathan Royal, I looked at him and said, hey, would you like to come over to the house and, and have dinner with us? He said, no, I don't know you. It's not in our culture to invite people to your house the first time you meet them. I don't do that anymore. I always invite people out to eat. That's the first thing I do. My second step is to get him in my home. So as a first step, you always take people out to eat. This is Keith Ritchie. This is, his, uh, this is uh, Jacksonville. And Keith does this regularly, he takes him out to eat. ...and gets to know them, that's a prospecting step. You're loving people, you pay for their meal, they, they greatly appreciate that kind of love. Let's go to another prospecting step, all right, it's the next one. And uh, Caleb, can you advance that for me? It uh, seems to lock up there. Um, there you go, okay, there's the meal, uh, that's the training card. And let's ask a question, did Jesus eat with people, yes or no? And he, what, who did he eat with? He ate with sinners, and what did they call him? Oh, he's a sinner. He's a publican. He, he eats with publicans. Look at this man over here. You know, uh, look at that Lord you have. He's a wine bibber. He's a, he eats with publicans and sinners. Well, that's exactly who we need to be eating with. <laughs> and so, so when's the last time you ate with a sinner? When's the last time you, you had a dinner with one? Because that's what we, uh, service projects, you know, build a, build a, a ramp, uh, fix a mailbox, love thy neighbor as thyself. So there's a lot of different ways. Mow a lawn, you know, rake leaves, uh, uh, clean a house. Um, uh, um, Chris said they, they actually took a house and, you know, had a dumpster come up to it because it was, this guy just couldn't take care of it anymore. And they just filled it, you know, he couldn't clean it up. Well, they cleaned it up for him. They baptized him. And, uh, but, uh, you know, there are times when service projects are a form of prospecting. You know, help fix a car, help replace a window. I mean, there's a lot of things. So there are guys, burly guys sitting in your congregation there. Well, you know, I'm, I can't do a Bible study. I'm not going to, you know, we don't really want them greeting visitors because they'd scare them away. But we can send them to the church and we can replace a window. We can fix whatever because they can fix anything. So everybody has a place in evangelism. Everybody can do something. All right, let's keep going. This is one of the most powerful places to prospect, it's your home. This is your home. Let me show you a little bit about this picture right here. All right. This right here is a Methodist. That's a Baptist. That is, his name is Scary Gary. He was the scariest man in the entire community. No one talked to Scary Gary. All right. So this is the Mormon right here. This right here is my daughter. That's a Baptist over here, a Baptist, a Methodist. That's my wife sitting on the floor. What are we doing? We're prospecting. Uh, they're all Christians in that picture, by the way. Every one of them's converted. From the Mormon to Scary Gary, all right? And uh, so all these people, how did we do it? In their home. We, get, we always take people into our home. If I put you into my home, it's almost a guarantee that you're going to do a Bible study. It's almost guaranteed, all right? That is the best place to prospect people. It's better than Cracker Barrel. It's better than uh, uh, any restaurant you can pick. If you put people in your home, um, you're going to get that study. It's, it's so relaxing. It's in familiar territory. Now, you can go to their home. It's okay. You can go to their home. Now, I know it's not for everybody. Maybe if you're a widow lady and you're saying to yourself, I don't know if I want to have a big family in my home. It's okay. Go to your preacher and say, hey, I'll, I'll help you. I'll do the dishes. I'll help clean. You know, I'll be part of this. We do need, you know, people helping. And one of the things that helped my wife was when, as, as we were doing this, 
Nicole's worried about cleaning the dishes. She's worried about making the dinner. I don't want her doing all that stuff. I need her helping me so we could ask ladies to come in and do that for us. And they say, hey, we need your help. We, could you come to the house? You know, I remember being at uh, Betty and Danny Raiders, and there's this lady in the kitchen. I never saw her. And I, said, I, I finally said, Danny, who is that woman? One of the widow's ladies. Every time I do a Bible study, I have guests over. She comes over and really rubs. She made this meal, and she cleans up for us. That allows Betty and I to talk. I said, that was a really good idea. Now, that was, I, I love that because that gets people involved. And uh, that, that maybe that older lady doesn't feel comfortable having a family over and doing all that, but she can help. So once again, figuring out how we get our members in our homes and working, I thought that was excellent. So this is where I want to park it. Or I want to park right here for just a minute. This is called the transition. So all the work, all the work you've done right here, this is so important right here. All the work here, here, you're right here. This is where you're at at that point. You're at the transition. What is the transition? That means that you've got to take the list of people that you've been reaching out to by cards, by meals, whatever it is, and you've got to move them from the prospect stage to the Bible study stage. There are some congregations that just excel at one and two. I mean, they're excellent. But I never see Bible studies. In fact, yesterday I reached out to one of them. I said, I said, dear brother, I said, you're probably one of the best churches in this school when it comes to steps one and two. I said, but I never see Bible studies. I said, are you struggling to get to study? And they are. I just want them to reach back. Because the transition is the key. So those are the, the transition is designed for the people that are going to lead Bible studies or be the silent partners. Okay, So we're going to assemble. We can do it on you know, Mission Monday. Uh, you can do it on Transition Thursday or Sunday. Like Chris says, they do theirs on Sunday. And they just have a meal and everybody stays. They're going to get their list out and say, okay... This person here and this person here have got 56 cars, 63 cars. They've been on the list for three weeks. Brother, I would, would you and your wife go visit this person? Would you guys go visit this person? Kara, would you get with them and go visit this person? And we're just going to go down the list and we're going to sign out the visits. Now, if you do not assign out the visits, what happens? You're the Lions Club. That's what happens. You're not the church because the Lions Club does steps one and two. We're not the Lions Club. Our job is to get them to the Bible study. You will not have Bible. They are not going to walk in your church and say, hey, would you study the Bible with me? That is extremely rare. All right. So you got to go to them. So when we go, so we're training. I'm talking about what do we say? Now, here's the three transition questions. I've been talking about these for two days. I wanted you to write these down. These are the three transition questions that we recommend. If someone can come up with better questions, I'm all ears. But these are the three questions we use when we make this visit. Now, when you go to the door, expect to be invited in. Expect to get a friendly visit, a warm welcome. If I go to the door and they, they're hesitant, even after getting all that love, do you know what that tells me? They're not ready. They're just not ready. Don't force it. Don't, 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 don't just drop them off the list and, and maybe at some other point in their life, they'll be receptive. By the way, back on the cards, let me, let me talk about this just very briefly. When you send cards out, you're going to come across a person from time to time who does not want the cards. They're just going to be, they're going to be negative, all right? What's my response to that? Here it is. Um, they, were never, they were never approachable to begin with. Okay, they, they're, they're not reachable. You've done no harm. It doesn't matter what you did. Okay, you weren't going to get to them. So every now and then we reach a person and they're just not interested. It's okay. And I had an eldership say to me, Travis, one time I was in a meeting and they had all these success stories. They had one encounter like this. We're considering dropping this program because somebody get upset. And, um, and uh, I just shook my head and I'm, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to find a respectful way to reply, a respectful way and, 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 and try to think this through. Okay, so you're going to drop something because one person gets upset of the 50, right, that you've been successful with, all right? So you're always going to have someone like that. It's always going to happen. Not everybody's reachable right now. So the card did their job. What did the cards do? It determined that that person wasn't reachable. So you don't waste any more time. That's what it did. The prospecting worked. Prospecting is not always about success. Prospecting is about also finding those who aren't. And we found out. So the same is here. When you make that transitional visit, if the person, they say, oh, by the way, thank you for the cards you sent me, but I already got my church. Well, what do we do now, Rob? You be polite and leave. That's what you do. I don't have a magic wand. All right, they're not reachable. 
And, and in fact, most people are not reachable. Most people are not reachable. So this, so, but when I get to the door, oh yeah, y'all come on in, come on, you know, and, uh, and, and you sit down and, and uh, oh, let, let me show you all the cards. They got them, you know, taped all over the wall. And, and, and it was so nice. One of your men mowed my lawn, whatever it is, and you're just talking, you know, and so I, I need to get to that transition. What am I, I'm going to make it very natural. Let's, let's just pretend I'm in your house and you and I are conversing and you're talking about all how thankful you are. I said, you know, um, I'm kind of, uh, I, I got a question for you. I, I need your help. Um, I, I want to know what people think about our church. And I know what I think about it, but I'm a member of that church. Would, would you tell me what you think about the uh, Petersville Church of Christ? And, and, and what would you say if you had 70 cards sitting in your house? What, 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 what would y'all say? Oh, yeah. Oh, nice church. Really nice church. I mean, they have really, you know, it's going to be kind. Now, there's a, there's, a, there's a little saying. It says, a good lawyer never asks a question he doesn't know the answer to. Never. I, I'm the same way. I don't ask. I would, I would not ask that question if I knew the answer was bad. I know the answer is good. Second question, okay. Um, hey, do you know a lot about the Highland Park Church of Christ? Do you know a lot about us? What are they going to say? No, they do not know a lot about you. I already know that. That's why I asked the question. All right? So I got the answer I wanted. These are called intentional questions. They lead into each other. First question, what do you think about the Highland Park Church of Christ? I do it very naturally. Second, hey, do you know a lot about us? Uh, again, very natural. I'm not reading a cue card. All right? This is a very natural conversation. Number three, my third question is this. Um, hey, uh, um, would you like to know a little bit more about us? If they say, you know, yeah, I'd like to know a little bit more about you. What are they asking you to do? A Bible study. They're asking you to do it. Do it. You know, oh, I got these little booklets. We could, you know, maybe we could look at them. Maybe you got some time right now. Or let's, hey, how would you like to come over to the house maybe tomorrow? We'll, we'll eat together and I'd love to tell you a little bit more about our church. It's really, it's a, it's a very smooth transition all right, so it's not awkward. It's not like you're putting them in a corner. Uh, they're asking you. Remember, one of my rules in evangelism, this is just my personal rule, I never ask for Bible studies. I know that you've heard lessons, and I love my preacher friends. I just don't think they have experience uh, in the modern era because if they did, they wouldn't say this. If you want a Bible study, just go ask for it. I'm like, no, don't do that. You know, do not go out there asking people to study the Bible. They're going to think you're a fanatic. All right, they don't, they, they don't like that. And, 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 and as soon as I say, hey, would you like to study the Bible? You kind of put yourself in a position where, hey, I know more than you do, so let's study the Bible. It's not good, right? So, but if you make it where they're asking you, and hey, I'd love to talk to you a little bit more about our church. Man, you have, you, that's exactly what you wanted. And now, now, I realize there were times in our nation where we could ask that question and get them. I get that. So there, there are soul winners from our past. And they said, that's how I did. I just asked people for Bible studies. They'd say, yes, we don't live in that culture anymore. I'm telling you, that, that number is few right there. They're still there, but it's very few. Most people do not want to be engaged like that. They, they, they want it, it's more of a passive. You've got to be very passive in the way you do it. It's just our culture. It doesn't matter if you like it or not. It's just where we at, we're at. Um, so once they say yes, now the transition takes place. Now, um, how many of those visits do I have to make to get a Bible study? That's the question I want to ask. How many transition questions do I have to make to get a Bible study? Ten. Now, let's back up a little bit. Let's just back up. Let's look at our numbers. All right. How many prospects, how many, how many prospects or contacts is it going to take for me to get those 10 visits? A hundred. So I'm going to have a hundred contacts. It's going to result in 10 prospects and give me how many Bible studies? One. That's realistic. That is very realistic. And so when people talk about, you know, evangelism and how, yo, we're just going to go out there and we're going to, no, you're not. You're going to work very hard to get that Bible study. So let's back up. So now how many contacts do you need at, Peters, uh, uh, at Petersville? How, how many Bible study, how many contacts do you need at Highland Park? You need uh, 3,000. You have 300 members, you need 3,000. How are you going to get 3,000? Your members. That's where you're going to get them. And you're going to do a lot of work to get there. So, so evangelism is hard work. I have no magic wand. I have no, I had a, I had a, a eldership say, what's your magic bullet? And I said, brother, I'm sorry, I don't have one. 
It takes a lot of work. It takes a congregational culture. Everybody's got to work together to get there. If you do it, I promise it works, but I can't just do this and make you have Bible studies, right? Um, and we're always looking for the McDonald's drive through We're looking for, oh, you know, quick, it's good. It's, it's, it's not there. There's no McDonald's approach to this. So you're going to have to go through a process here. So I'll visit. Now, there are times when we can make prospecting visits and get three or four studies. There's times I get none. But that right there is, that's the key right there, is that prospecting. So who's part of this team? Well, we definitely want our preachers and elders because they're, you know, they're, they should be able to do a Bible study. And there's some other members. If there are members that are part of this who are not proficient, that's okay. Make them the silent partner. It's okay because we need them to learn. We need them to watch how this takes place. So we, we, we can do this, but this right here is key. This is one of your key people, all right? Let's keep going. We got to do a sermon on prospecting and transition and what that looks like, what our purpose is, how we're going to set it up. So training is important. That's our evangelism table. Oh, this is, this is crucial. So if you're going to have a, a, a church that's evangelizing, you have to equip the church with the tools to do the job. If the church does not have back to the Bible, they can't use it, Carol. If they don't have, does it matter? They can't use it. If they don't have these tools, they're not going to use it. So we have to make sure the church has the tools to do the job. Most of our church is well-equipped for coffee. They're well-equipped to have coffee. They're not well-equipped to do Bible studies. They don't have the tools. And so they're well-equipped to, to open up a teacher's, you know, supply room. They're not well-equipped to have Bible studies. So here's what we recommend. Everybody look at this. This is the training car, but let me show you the, well, I don't have the pictures on there, but that is a picture of one. Um, there is a, there, there, I, I want you to put a table out in your foyer. If you have multiple entrances, you have multiple tables, and make sure that every member has to trip over it to get out of the building. And we're going to put all the stuff on there. That's our evangelism center. Oh, but Rob, we've got a library that's perfect for this that no one ever goes into. Wendell Winkler used to say the baptistry is the most neglected room in the church. Your library is the second. Okay, they don't use it. All right. So they're not going into the library. They're not going to go into your special room. You've got to put it out there in the foyer. And you've got to make sure that everybody has access to it. And the preacher has got to get in the pulpit from time to time. And Chris has got to hold up a tool. Chris is going to hold up a tool and say, okay, this is called Does It Matter? And this is its purpose. This is how we use it. This is called Back to the Bible. And this is its purpose. This is called Believe the Bible. And this is its purpose. So there's different tools that we use. And I know you don't know all of those. I don't have time to explain all of those. But you have to have access to the tools. And you have to explain to church members. And the preacher has to teach. So when it comes to, when it comes to evangelism table, we have to train. It doesn't matter that you have back to the Bible if you don't train them. So we'll pass out on a Sunday morning. So um, as a preacher, what does this look like? As a preacher, we're going to pass out back to the Bible, the teacher's edition to every person in the pew on a Sunday morning. And we're going to ask you to preach it. We're going to ask you to preach through the booklet. And we're going to let the membership fill in the blank. So what happens if the members take a tool and they fill in the blank and they're learning, of course, about, you know, Bible authority. They're learning about it. If they understand how to use it, what might they do? They might use it. Everybody know Cliff Goodwin? Cliff Goodwin's an incredible preacher. Um, and he's like top notch. He replaced James Watkins. He's handpicked by James Watkins to replace him. And... Uh, and so Cliff, Cliff, I went to where Cliff's at, Ronitan uh, uh, Church of Christ in Alabama. And uh, I did this. And several months later, I asked Cliff how many baptisms. I just, you know, they had like several, uh, eight or whatever it was. I said, Cliff, that doesn't surprise me because to me, you're one of the best preachers that are in the brotherhood. And I said, I said, it doesn't surprise. We're good friends. Well, he said, Rob, he said, I didn't do them. This is very interesting what he told me. I said, who did it? The widow's. I said, the what? She said, and my daughter, Kinley. I said, whoa, wait a minute. What? He said, Rob, we taught the church how to use back to the Bible, and they're doing them. He said, we have widow ladies, and we have young people that are conducting Bible studies. Uh, Kirk Brothers and I talked about this yesterday, and just uh, um, for the preachers and elders in the audience, uh, and anybody listening, listen to me carefully. I'm going to look right in the camera. Okay, if you want to save your young people, if you want to keep them from falling away, train them to be soul winners. Let them convert just one friend. I promise you, every young person that converts just one friend, you have them for life. They're not leaving. 
And so if we will train our young people how to do Bible studies, if we'll equip them, if we'll create an atmosphere in our local churches where every activity is about bringing one lost person, one, one friend, and then we're engaging that person to try to, and we teach them how to do studies. If Chris says to you know, one of the 15-year-old boys, hey, come with me, I've got a Bible study. I'd like you to see how this works. That's how, that's how I got started. It was Wade Brown and Anthony Castillo at the Northern Oaks Church that used to bring me to Bible study. I didn't know they were training me. And once I saw how exciting a Bible study was, you couldn't stop me. I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen in my life. And, and they kept taking me. And now I'm, now I'm taking them with me. I said, hey, I got a friend. At, I, I found a friend at San Antonio College. I said, hey, Anthony, would you come with me? Because he, 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 I'm going to do this Bible study with him. But he's bringing his Baptist pastor. And I said, I said I, I'm, I'm afraid about this. And so, I mean, I was constantly in Bible studies with people. Constantly. If you'll do that, it grounded me. What did that force me to do as a, as a young person? It forced me to know who I was. How are you going to have a Bible study if you're not convicted? How are you going to have a Bible study if you don't believe in the church of Christ? Evangelism forces you to know yourself. And so if we want to save our young people, teach them how to do a Bible study. Show them how to do it. And, and create events where they can actually succeed. Not just back to the Bible, but just use the tool called Believe the Bible. Does anybody have Believe the Bible out in your, your bag? If you don't, that's okay. Um, it's another tool. It's for people who don't believe in God. They don't believe in the Bible. They don't believe in Christ. And so you can't use back to the Bible because back to the Bible, um, it, it, it requires that fundamental pillar, the pillars. It requires that. But if you've got someone that says, you know, I'm not really sure. I, I think I know there's a God. But how do you know that Bible is the word of God? I start with, letter, I start with believe the Bible, lesson B. And we go through the Bible. It's not, I don't give them a book by Kyle, but I love Kyle. Kyle and I are friends. All right, but Kyle will tell you, giving a person a book versus doing a Bible study, huge difference, huge. All right, I love World Video Bible School. I work with them. I do their videos. But I'm telling you that giving them a video link versus sitting down across the table, that's right, Travis. What we've been talking about, Travis, is what we've been talking about. You can't replace that. So the Bible study is key. Now, here's my question. Will the members of the church do this if you don't train them? No, they're scared to death of it. They're scared to death. They can't do it. Will they use belief? No, they're not. And so you have to, as a preacher, say, well, we'll put a group together on Monday night. Uh, um, brother, how many, how, many, how many are going to come on Monday night? Of 300? 30? All right. How many are there on Sunday morning? 300. Do it on Sunday morning. <laughs> do it when they're there. All right, let's take advantage of the, the church assembly time. So let's, let, and I'm not trying to mess up your preaching schedule. Please, I'm not trying to do that. I said, but let's just take a few, uh, you know, a, a little bit of time each year and train our people how to do this in the pulpit and put the tool in their hand. I promise, brethren, I guarantee if you do that, you'll see changes in your church. That's the culture change we're talking about. You empower people. You, so you're just not preacher. You got to evangelize. We got to evangelize. We got now you're showing them how to evangelize. And they'll do it. So all of this is part of our school. We have a curriculum, and that's part of the, the schooling. Now, there are some tools that not everybody needs. And I want to talk about the Navy SEALs. All right? So Chris Miller needs to have a little bit more than just back to the Bible. I want Chris to be able to handle the tough stuff. Carol, you asked me a tough question, and I'm going to deal with it right now. You said, hey, Rob, what do you do when uh, you're working with a family member and, uh, or somebody and they look at you and say, are you telling me my mother's going to hell? Okay, not everybody's equipped for that. And they don't need to be. But we need Chris to be equipped with that. I, we need to know how to handle that question. So there are materials in your bag that are designed to answer those questions. All right, they're designed to help people through those things. And uh, so let me give you a, a, what happened to me, a, a quick story. So... I'm about to study with a young lady. Her dad dies suddenly in a heart attack. She's a young lady, right? And we were, we were actually scheduled for the study. So she's, she's like 19 years old. Her dad dies of a massive heart attack. He is not a Christian. She's not a Christian. Her mom's not a Christian. And the funeral, you know, takes place. The church loved her. I mean, they wrapped their arms around this family. Because I, 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 I spent a lot of capital to get this done. Because I knew that I needed that. So after, the, after it's over... 
Clifton, who's going to, he's going to, he wants to marry her. He wants to propose to her. He won't do it until she's a Christian. He's, de, he's depending on me to do this study with his girlfriend. And, and Clifton, he asked me a question. He says, so what are you going to say, Rob? And uh, my answer was, I don't know. Because I did not know at the time what to say. And I was, this is years ago. I didn't know what to say. And so I started calling. I called soul winners. Larry Acuff is still one of the great soul winners that's with us. If y'all don't know Larry Acuff, he's at... Uh, um, he's in Georgia, um, I'm trying to think, Lithia Springs Church of Christ. He's one of the few remaining great soul winners we've got in the brotherhood. He's up in years, but his mind is sharp, and he's still preaching, and Larry Acuff knows how to do it. All right, so I call. I call men like that. I don't, I, don't, I don't call people that are not soul winners. I call the soul winners and say, how do you answer that question? How do you answer? And I finally got a preacher that gave me a really good answer, very biblical. And he took me to Hebrews 11:4. In Hebrews 11, 4, it says, By faith Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he is righteous, God testifying of his gifts, though being dead yet speaketh. He said, Rob, the dead speak. And I suggest we listen to him. I said, okay. I'm I'm trying to follow his line of reasoning. He says, Callie's dad is speaking to her in that Bible study, and you need Callie to listen to her dad. He said, Rob, what's Callie's dad telling her to do? I got it. He said, let's go to Luke 16 and let's learn. Now, Luke 16 is the account of the rich man of Lazarus. What did the rich man say? Father Abraham, I've got five brethren. Oh, Father Abraham, send me back that I may testify to them, lest they come into this place of torment. Oh, nay, Father Abraham said, uh, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear that. Oh, no, Father Abraham, if one would rise from the dead, they would repent. He said, no, they wouldn't. It's a good, it's a good, here's why that parable helped me. The parable tells me that the rich man wants his brethren to go to heaven. What does Callie's dad want Callie to do? Go to heaven. So I'm in that Bible study and it, it's exactly what I thought happened. I mean, it happened exactly the way I thought it happened. She got the baptism. She's smart. She picks it up. She processes it. Her eyes fill with tears. She puts her head on the table and she just bawls. So some things that I have learned through the years to help. If a person ever cries in a Bible study, what should you do? Let them cry. Don't stop it. It's, a, it's, a God's way, it's God's way of healing. It's God's way of helping you through it. So don't stop the natural process. Let them cry. If you're I'm across the, the table with a young lady and I'm a man, I don't do this. I don't touch her. Okay, My wife does. My wife holds her. My wife held her. And uh, Clifton's over there patting her, patting her uh, hand. So this is one of those things, again, as you're with preachers, you've got to remind preachers that some of those situations are tough. And, you know, and if you're, that's why I don't do Bible studies with women by myself. I always have my wife or another woman with me because I do not want to be in one of those moments. No, 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 no. Bad things happen in those moments. All right? So, so we do that. She goes through this a couple minutes, picks up her head and looks at me. And now we're ready to talk. I said, Callie, I said... Uh, Tell me about your dad. And every minute that went by, she smiled bigger. Because now we're talking about her dad. Now, I'm not a psychologist nor a counselor, but you know what I'm doing. I'm getting her to talk about the good memories of her dad. Because I know that's going to help us. And she's telling me all about I said, well, well, was he religious? Now she's talking about the religion of her dad. I said, was he honest, hardworking? Yes, everything was good. I said, Callie, your dad sounds like someone that really cared about you. Yes, and he wants you to go to heaven. Yes. Callie, did your dad always, would your dad always want you to do what the Bible says? She said, yes, my dad would always want me to do what the Bible says. Brother, the answer is right in front of you. All I looked at, I said, Callie, I promise you, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask you to listen to your dad and only do what the Bible says. I'll ask no more, no less. I said, if your dad were standing here right now, would he tell you to do what we just read? And she looked at me. She said, my dad would tell me to do what the Bible says, Mr. Rob. I said, let's go do it. And we did. And that's how we overcame that obstacle. So I do that by turning it around. Now, the devil wants to use that for evil. He wants to use it as a punitive measure. Okay. We used it as an incentive to do what's right. You always have to outsmart the wily one. He's the father of all lies. He loves to deceive. But I know that this is actually a net positive for Callie because I just want her to listen to her dad. I cannot change, I cannot change the, now let me give you another real quick example. 
So I talked to one of these, one soul winner, and he says, yeah, I always use the story of the fire. Have y'all know about the story of the fire? Y'all ever seen this before? So this is how he dealt with it. And this is, I, I, I did not do this. I would never do this. He said, I want you to tell them the story of the fire. So you're sleeping in a house in your bedroom. Your parents are on the other side of the house in their bedroom. Fire starts and it's raging. And they're yelling, Travis, Travis, get out of the house. Mom, where are you at? Travis, get out of the house. There's a window right there. Travis, get out. Mom, where are you at? There's no window where you're at, Mom. Tra don't worry about me, Travis. Get out of the house. Mom, I'm not leaving. Get out of the house, Travis. If you don't, get out of the house. And you just, what do you do? You burn down with them? <laughs> that was the answer given to me. Do you really think that's going to be a story that's going to help her go to heaven? Now, I'm, both, story, both things we did teach the same thing, but we got to be smart. What's Matthew 10, 16? Jesus said, be therefore what? Wise as serpents and subtle as doves. What's a dove? Love, compassion. That's, that's why he said, be compassionate. Because it is a tough thing. But there's a way to say it and present it whereby the, the end result is still good. But yet you did it in such a way that you love that person into it and you didn't scare them into it. So, so I thought that was a pretty interesting as I was calling soul winners and getting different perspectives. I thought it was very interesting to see those two. I picked the other one. <laughs> I thought that worked better and it does. So you've got to train people how to deal with the difficult situations. And those are books. In your materials, you have this right here. Um, people still like the old flip charts. I get asked all, you know, hey, do you have a flip chart? So we made all the charts into a flip chart. The good thing about your flip chart is on the back there's a script on what to say, on what page number you are to use it, and in what study method. It's really, really well done. So that is the evangelism visualized, and it's in your packet of material. So does every member of the church need that, Chris? No. No. Who needs it? The Navy SEALs. That's, that's it. So we make sure just the people who need this material. So that's when you have to have a little bit of a, um, uh, you know, clear, cl clarity that we're not going to give 300 of those out in the church. It's a waste of money. But there's probably 20 or 30 members, brother, in your church that probably need this. Every, usually around 10% of your church is part of that Navy SEAL team. And you could probably think of them right now. These are the people we go to that can help me. But we're not going to ask Angry Fred or Gabby Gossip. We're not going to give it to them. We don't want, we don't, we just rather them be somewhere else, you know. So that's where we're at. So let's keep going. Um, kitchen table Bible studies. Uh, that's, that's what I'm trying to do. I want them to get to the kitchen table. I really want them there. Why do I want them there? Why do I want you at the kitchen table? Anybody want to answer that? Why would I want you at the kitchen table? It's the most comfortable place in life. If I get you around the table, do you, you said you do some counseling. Do you ever use a round table when you're counseling? I'm just curious. Not, not a lot. Okay. Yeah. There's, a, there's, a, there's a psychological process in a round table. It puts everybody on an equal footing. And, 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 and so when you're in a Bible study, I, I'm not the head. I'm never at the head. I love a round table. I love it to be, you know, in my home. We've just eaten dinner and I got everything set up and we just sit around that table my success rate about that table in the last six years, that's our new place in Jacksonville. We've lived there six years. Every single Bible study resulted in a baptism but two. So we have a very, very good success rate when I get you there. So, so someone says, well, why don't you do the Bible study at McDonald's? It's too noisy and distractions. Why don't you do it at the church building? I'm not saying you can't. I've used the church building before. I'm sure you have, Chris. Um, but there's nothing more relaxing than your home. Or their home. It just, it, it, and you said the right word. So it's relaxing. I want you right there. It's where I'm going to take you. Um, those are the other tools. Does it matter? Believe the Bible. Let me talk about them real quick. This is the one study method. So if you've had somebody in your pews, they've, they've, been, they've been there for 10 years, but they've never obeyed the gospel, they don't need back to the Bible. They don't need all of that. They just need to get across the finish line. That's what does it matter does. It takes you across. The, it's the one study method. All right. Chris, you've used that a few times. I have too. There are situations where Chris and I will come across somebody and uh, you know they already know. You, you know they got it. They just need help. Or you just don't know if you have enough time to do back to the Bible. So there's, there's, that's, that's evangelistic you know, perception. You're trying to use your skill set to figure out what I... That one up there, that is for those who don't believe in God, the Bible, or Christ. If, you can use all three or just one. 
It's A for atheist, B for Bible inspiration, C for Christ. That's how I remember it. Or purple royalty, Christ, B, the ground, the green, the word, or there's God, the throne, gold. Wherever you want to remember it, that's how those books are organized. It's a Bible study. And it's designed to interact, designed to help them come to an understanding of truth. Um, John Garza is in Austin, Texas. He said 15 to 20 percent of his Bible studies start with Believe the Bible in Austin, Texas. They don't do that in Hatton, Alabama. They probably don't do that in Florence. But in Austin, Texas, they do. Okay, if you're in New York where you have a Clarence Jenkins, it's like 50%. It's like 50% of my studies start here because they're, they're just not ready for back to the Bible. So that's why those questions, remember those questions we did, that role play yesterday, you know, how, so I know what study to use. That's why I do those questions, all right? Let's keep going. That's what I want. I want baptisms. I want congregational joy. I want people to see that. That is key. Now, the problem is we don't see that. How often does someone come forward on a Sunday morning to be baptized? Yeah, they're, all the preachers are saying like this. Uh, would you like that to happen? Yes, why? What's one of the benefits of that? That's right. You know we can fix that. It's called the video camera. And we video every baptism. And after the invitation song, you sit everybody down. Say, brethren, we had a baptism Thursday night. and We'd like you to see it. And then when you're done, is there anything wrong with having the church stand up and hold hands and pray? I mean, that is moving right there. So we make sure that every baptism, every baptism videoed, and I ask, almost everybody says yes. Would you mind if I share that to the church? Because they've sent you those cards. I would encourage them to see that. Yeah, I want them to see that. Every now and then you got so much real shy and they don't want anybody. To, it's okay. We won't show it. But like nine out of ten will let you. And that becomes congregational joy. So I get this from Dave Ramsey. I, I've toured his place. In fact, his second in command is a member of the church. I've got to meet him. I've been in Dave's office. And one of the things they like to do at the, at the, at the Financial Pete's Institution is they like to share success with their employees. When you're successful, the employees are successful. And he talks a lot about that in his seminars. And I thought about churches. Okay, so when we've had a baptism, which is the most successful thing we can actually do in a church, don't we need everyone to enjoy that success? Yes, that's how we do it. So I could say a lot more about it, but I'll, there's a training card actually on this. And, and it talks about, you know, recording it and rejoicing together as a church and the reward. You know, give them an AP study Bible. You know, make sure you give them a baptismal certificate. There's still things we can do to recognize people, and we should. We should do all that, all right? Now, there's your AP study Bible. All right, now, I, I wanted to get here, then we're going to take a break after this one right here, and I'm going, to, I'm going to take you into the website the next session. That's our last session is our next session, and that's where I, I can show you how, how to access. So, new converts. Let me give you a couple of things about new converts. First, you should have a new convert course. First, you should have a new convert course. First, you should have a new convert course. If your church does not have a new convert class, you've got a problem. One of two things are true. Number one, you have no new converts. And, that'd be the, that, that, and I had an eldership, a church of 400 and some in Huntsville, Alabama. And I asked them, I said, do you have a new convert class? And they said, no. I said, well, why? They said, we have no new converts. I wasn't expecting that answer for 400 and some members. That, that's, that's depressing. In fact, that, that year, um, there were three churches that I went and did this seminar to that measured 1,500, 1,600 members in those three churches, and they had a total of seven baptisms before I came. Seven. <laughs> I mean, that is just terrible. In uh, any case, so, so you got to have a new convert class. We want a new convert class to exist. Now, new convert classes need to be taught primarily by elders. I highly recommend that elders teach this class. It's the funnest class in the church. We have a whole curriculum for new converts. It takes a year to take them through it. It's on Sunday and Wednesday. I do not want the new convert in your adult class. It's a dangerous place to be. They're going to hear things they don't understand. They're going to be um, exposed to things they shouldn't be. Every now and then, I hope it doesn't happen at your church, an adult class becomes cantankerous. And they do not need to be around that. Okay, So we do not want them to be in your adult. We want them to be in a special class that is designed to help them grow. It's 1 Peter 2.2, 2, Wherefore, um, as newborn babes, desire the sincere milk of the word that you may grow thereby. Give them milk. Do not put a new convert in the meat class. Put him in the milk class. All right, that's very, very important. Now, the second thing we're going to do with new converts, and let's go here, and that's a training card that, that goes over all this, all right, is mentoring. So every new convert should be assigned members to mentor them. 
How many mentors should new converts have? Three. Three. Every new convert gets at least three mentors. That means we say, hey, Carol, we've got this new convert. We'd like you to mentor them for us. Well, what does that mean? We'll, we'll train you. Let me give you a quick idea. It means that you send them a uh, link from World Video Bible School. Perhaps, why are those so many churches? Hey, would you watch this? And let's get together Friday and we'll talk about it. Uh, hey, would you like to go to ice cream? Go to a ball game. That's what mentors do, right? They just help. Mentors are helping to connect without. We don't want Chris. We want other members. We want to get the new. So that's a very important part of evangelism is your mentoring. Now, let me give you one, a couple of things here. Um, when, that, when that new convert comes out of the baptistry and is drawing off, I, I said earlier, you have a, like a very short window, like a 15-minute window to do something critical. Does anybody know what that window is? What would that would be? There's about a 15-minute window, and you've got to do it within about 15 minutes, or you're going to ruin it. Okay, here it is. Okay. They know a lot of people that are lost. They know a lot of people that are lost. What are they going to do when they get home? Call their friends and family, and what are they going to tell them? Yeah, but they don't know how to say it. And they're going to burn every bridge they got. Okay, the new convert does not know how to communicate his salvation or her salvation. And so in that communication, they're going to come across in a way that suggests what? Hey, you're going to hell, didn't you know? They didn't say it, but that's what it means. The new convert does not understand evangelism. They do not understand how to communicate. So here's what I normally do with new converts. Hey, Betty, I mean, I know this is one of the most exciting days in your life. We're excited for you. Um, I tell you what, we're going to start a class Sunday morning just for you. So I immediately invite them to the convert class. They never go to the adult class. I said, I need to talk to you a little bit about how to, how to reach out to your family and friends that don't know what you know. And I said, so if you can hold back, you know, from, from, from reaching out to them, because I know you want to tell them, we're going to talk about how to tell them on, on that class. The first thing I do with new converts is I want your list. I want you, Betty, here's what I'd like you to do. Would you give me a list of all the people you know that are not Christians that you want to bring to Christ? And we'll start working on them on Sunday. If you don't do that, you're, they're going to ruin all their contact list. Because they're going to, they're, they're, they just don't know how to say it. So that's one of those windows. It's like a 15-minute window. It's when they're drying off till they leave the parking lot. If you don't get that done, if you don't say it, you know, quickly, they start burning bridges really fast, really fast. So this right here is very important, new converts um, in, the, uh, in, in, the, in the process. So we're, we'll take a little break. Uh, let's stretch your legs. I got one more session, and then we'll close things down. And, uh, and uh, there are some refreshments in the back. Thank you, uh, Travis, for you guys providing those. And uh, all right. You know, by, any questions, by the way? Does that make sense to everybody? Let me ask y'all a question. Um, how many of us have ever been trained on what to do with new converts? Okay, second question. How many of us are concerned about losing new converts? Okay, third question. What's the number one question I'm asked in an evangelism seminar? Yes, you baptize a lot of people, but how many of them stay faithful? It's the number, why is that? Because we lose new converts constantly. I don't think I have to answer my question, do I? I'll tell you why we're losing them. We don't do any of this stuff. We do absolutely none of this stuff. And, and we lose them, of course. So um, if I could make a little pun here. When they walk in the front door, lock the back door, don't let them out. Don't let them out. All right? So we're going we're gonna, to, we're gonna, someone says, how much energy does a new convert take? A lot. And you actually have to allocate resources and training and time in your church to make sure they don't fall away. Should the preacher be the one doing that? No, you should not be. You are not the guy to do that. The elders, nope. The elders can assign, but you guys have a lot going on. You should assign members to do this stuff. And even take in it into consideration age demographics, right? Likes and dislikes. And there's a hunter. Who do you put with them? The video game geek? No. I don't mean to be disrespectful, but no, you put the hunter guy with them, right? So you try to, you try to mentor and match people so they can, you know, so we just had a convert. My, we just baptized a man not long ago, and, um, and he loves fishing. So I immediately called the guy that loves fishing, and he took him fishing the next week. I said, I need you to take him fishing. I, well, first I said, I need your help in event. Oh, Rob, I don't do, I said, can you go fishing? 
Yeah. I said, I need you to take a guy. Oh, oh, I can do that. You know, but don't ask me to teach no class. I said, no, but can you fish? You know, he said, I got the best fishing spot in the county. That's what we're talking about. And that gets it. That fisherman, now he feels a part of evangelism. I love it, brethren. I just love it. All right, we'll take a break. Thank you, guys.
Do, oh, let me. It, it would help Caleb if I if I uh, plugged it in. It's not your fault. So Caleb's probably saying, "Why isn't it working?" I said, "Let me plug it in." All right, there we go. There we go. All right, there it is. So there is. This is this is uh, what you would uh, what it looks like when you go into the website, and uh, so it's going to give you a picture. You notice of the six step model. So this is the curriculum. So there has to be a step by step process for elders to follow. So I primarily give it to elders and preachers, but sometimes elders will say, I want this sister to have access or this brother to have access because they're going to help us, and that's fine. Uh, so this is the, what we call the congregational curriculum. Now, you're going to notice right here, it has the, the steps, you know, contacts, prospects, Bible studies. So look at your left. Look at the menu here. There it is. Notice contacts, prospects, Bible studies. So as you want to access one part of the model... You just go over and say, okay, I want to know more about contacts, okay? We just click it, and we, we go over, and we look at the part about contacts. Now, I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is just highlight a few things for you um, to share with you some things that, that, that are very helpful um, as we unfold the model. First, this is a tutorial, simple, how do you use the website? I'm not going to go there. Getting started. All right, so anytime a congregation enrolls in our school, they make a pretty good investment. The investment is in all those materials they need in order to train their church. The last thing we want a church to do, and I, I, I don't know if preachers, uh, Chris, um, did you preach before you went to Hatton? Did, you had a little church. But you, okay, let me tell you about, so I went to three churches in my ministry. And one thing that, that these churches have in common is that when you, when, you, when you unpack your stuff and you walk into the church building, it's empty. It's like a toy box for a preacher. We go through classrooms. We're looking around, you know, and every single church I've ever been to has stacks of stuff that elders have bought through the years, and they're sitting there. Nothing's being done. It's, it's, it's almost brittle. It's been there for so long. So we do not want that to happen. We, we do not want that to happen. We want everything that, that you guys uh, get in your package to be used, all right? So that's basically what we're saying. Listen. Um, you have enormous momentum. It's enormous that the, the, the members are ready. You have all the materials. Do something with what you just did. Do not sit here and suffer from analytical paralysis. Y'all you know what that is? Analysis by paralysis. You sit there for weeks and weeks and you analyze and you analyze and you analyze and we vote and we vote. So I went to a big church. I'll tell you the story of university in Montgomery, Alabama. And one of the elders came up. He's a great guy. He's a B-2 stealth bomber. He's the trainer. He's the guy that trains the pilots. And he's a great guy. He's an elder. And he came up to me and says, Rob, I know what you're going to have to do. He said, I just want to warn you. It's never happened in the history of this church. These elders don't make decisions. There's 27 elders and 27 elders. And I said, I said, he said, he said and it's going to be very difficult. He said, let me give you some pointers. And he gave me some pointers. I walked in. And I, and I did exactly what he told me to do. He's a stealth bo bomber bo uh, fighter pilot. He knows what he's talking about. And so I laid it all out. I used this model. And the elder said, hey, step out of the room for a few minutes. Two minutes later, I walked back in. They said the vote was 27 to 0, the start. That's an elder. That, that is what I'm talking about. Let's not sit there. And I warned them. I said, guys, if you tried to dissect this and analyze this, and if you try to figure out, well, we can do this, but this is better, nothing will get done. Absolutely nothing. All right. So there is a little trust factor in here. And what I ask churches to do, look at the 265 churches doing it. Look at the results and give us a little trust. Follow the model. What does an engineer always tell the people? Trust the process. Trust the process. So what does Chick-fil-A tell the new franchise? Trust the process. Don't mess the process up. So that's what I ask elders to do. And, and, and I do it respectfully. Just trust the process. So do something with your investment. All right. One of the first things we ask you to do is sign every member up for Reaching the Lost. Notice there's a video. If I push it, it's about five minutes. It's about a five-minute video. And when I do that, that's going to give you a little training. All my training videos are five minutes or less because I know time is critical. We need to sign every member up to get Reaching the Lost. That's our, web, that's our email training system. We send you reports. We send you videos. So we ask you to do that from the very beginning. Each modular, notice it says next step. Next step. Now you complete it. That yellow dot means I've completed the step. So that's our checklist. This is a very important part of what we do. Um, let me go ahead and, um, excuse me. Let me go back here. The checklist is here. All right. There we go. Let me pull that up. So that's your checklist. On your folder, every one of you got a folder like this, and I printed it for you. It's, it's in your bag. 
So that checklist here keeps you on point. So we would say to a church, all right, schedule a start date to begin. So if we, if we, went, to, if we went to Highland Park, brother, if we were there at Highland Park, our admonition to the elders would be start Sunday. Like immediately, do not let the dust settle. Don't let the fireworks fizzle. Get started. So we'd say, you know, set your start date. Now, every now and then you got, like I went to one church, they had a friends and family day scheduled the next Sunday. All right, you know, obviously do the next Sunday, right? But you need to start as soon as you can. So this, this checklist right here is really important because it keeps you on track. Who's my point of contact? So my point of contact for Hatton is Chris. He's the guy. Now, it doesn't mean Chris is in charge of everything. It just means that Chris is the guy I go through. So the elders, I'm sure, I know I, 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 they're in charge ultimately. But Chris is the guy that I talk to. Most churches, probably half of them, it's the preacher. The other half of them, it's a mixture of deacons, elders, and members. All right? So that's my point of contact. Okay, so I'm going to give you that poster. Everybody see that? Everybody got that big poster? We're going to have every church three or four of those. And we say frame them and hang them up. Why? What does Chick-fil-A do with their motto? Hang it and frame it up. And every employee knows that's our motto. We want every member to know that is our motto. Now, everyone needs to be signed up for reaching the lost. Look at this one right here, post-seminar survey. One of the things we want to do is get feedback from the members. We want to know where do they want to help? Are they interested? So watch this. Let's go back to our website. All right. Let's go up here to introduction, post-seminar survey. There it is. Let's click it. Okay, here it is. That's the post them in our survey. Print it and pass it out. And let the members tell you, what do we want to do? What, where, where do we want to work? And those are very, some very important questions here. Let me give you some that elders like. Here's a question number five. This program will add additional costs such as postage, meals for visitors, house-to-house -house mailings, materials, new mover baskets, benevolent needs, visitor bags. Do you believe we need to invest in local evangelism? That's a pretty good question, isn't it? All right, let's see the next question. While not asking for a specific amount, would you be willing to give money to see this work done? Do you think elders are concerned about the budget? Yes. What happens if members see a cause to give? They will give. Every eldership knows that. When, elder, when members see a need, they rise to the occasion. How often have the members disappointed you? Probably not much. When an eldership gets up there and says, we need, they do it. So that's what you're doing, right, in these questions. Look at these questions right here. Circle the area that you would like to be involved in or learn more about. So if you pass these out at Highland Park, you know, or Chris did, you're going to immediately get feedback from your members and know. So that's an important, that's an important part of the, of the that's a, we do that immediately. Like when we pull out of the parking lot that next Sunday, you should be doing that. So let's just look here uh, at a few other things under the introduction. This is important for preachers. This is called the preacher training schedule. So let's pull it out. So this right here, List Sunday number one, what should you preach? Sunday number two, what should you preach? Sunday p.m., what's the first training lesson? Sunday second p.m., what's the training lesson? So we're basically listing here the sermons. And you're, as a preacher, you're thinking, wow, I've got to develop all that. No, you don't. They're all canned. Everything I, I'm giving, I'm going to give you the sermons, the PowerPoints, the outlines, the manuscripts. Four by three, 16 by nine, we have everything for you. So that's, your, that's, that, that's kind of a breakdown of what, your, what the next three months might look like. Now, if you're a preacher and you say, hey, you know, um, I've got this series I'm working on. Um, I'm, I'm going to ask either suspend your series temporarily or let's juggle things around a little bit. If you need to use a Sunday morning Bible class for Summit, that's fine. But just realize if you don't use your Sunday morning assembly, you're getting less people. And we're trying to maximize the people that are there. All right. So there's a few other things here. I'm going to show you one that's my favorite. This is one of my favorites. All right, I love this right here. There's the video that explains it. There's the, the, um, the directions. This I love. What if we put that in the front of our auditorium? What if we put it right here? What if we did that at Hatton or Highland Park? Have y'all done this, Chris? Yeah, no, I think I sent... Have y'all started this yet? Okay. I, th I think I... You've got those. So what if you put this up front and say, okay, how many visitors have we had for January? And uh, so here's what the studies tell us. The studies tell us that a church of 100 people needs three to five visitors a week to grow. So you're 300. That means you need nine to 15 visitor, visitors a week to grow. Would it be important to know how many visitors you have? And if you're not hitting that, 
we can work on that. We can work on improving that. So those, Lifeway did that study. They just said, hey, the average church out here, how many visitors do you need to have a week to grow? I have no reason to doubt that's valid. No reason to say, oh, that doesn't, you know, just because it's Lifeway, all right? So they have no, you know, they're just trying to help churches know, hey, out here, okay, visits. How many visits have we been making this week? You know, how many of those transition visits have we made? Okay, how many cards have we sent? How many prospects are on our list? How many Bible studies? Well, there's more categories than that. What's our baptism goal? Um, a church of 200 should baptize 20 a year. It's 10%. A church of, uh, of, of 100 baptizes 10. And so 70% of the churches in our school reach their goal. They reach their goals. And so we should have goals. And, the, and, and, and by the way, if you don't have Bible studies, you don't have baptisms. Bible studies equal baptisms. So we want to make sure Bible studies have a 90% return rate. So once again, those are tools in the introduction. And you'll have all that in your package. Just go to contacts, all right? So we're here in the model. We go to contacts. And I'm going to show you a video of what it looks like. See, you don't have, we won't have audio, will we, Caleb? Marker. Can y'all hear this? Okay. I'm going to get out mine. Got several that uh, need one. Because we're going to be using this every week. This is not something we're just doing this Sunday. We are going to do this every week. And let me tell you why, why, why those are being handed out. Uh, Brother Grider, if you want to grab some, there's some more on the evangelism table. Uh, we, can, we can get those handed out. Um, let, let me tell you why we're going to be using these every week. Because without contacts, we cannot take the gospel, okay? I want you to raise, I know there's some of you raising your hands, but you should keep your hand raised for this. Raise your hand if you know 10 non-Christians, you know 10 sinners, okay? If you struggle to know 10 sinners, I want you to do one thing. Get out your cell phone, go through your contacts in your cell phone, and find 10 names of people you do not know that, that are Christians. They're not members of the Lord's church, okay? That's an easy way to find 10 contacts. You probably work with 10 people that are non-Christians. You go to school with people that are non-Christians, okay? So your first job, if you're just now receiving this bookmarker, is to write down 10 names, 10 people that, that maybe you're very close to, 10 people that you maybe want to get closer to, but I want 10 people who are non-Christians written down on your name. And every week we're going to pray uh, for those names. Here in a second, I'm going to pray uh, as a congregation for... Um, so we have videos. The videos are designed to train the church, to give you an idea of what it looks like. So that's the first Sunday. When we roll out of the parking lot, you should be doing that Sunday number one. That helps elders see what you're doing, right? So that, that follows. Here's the sermon that we'd like the preachers to preach. It's called Jesus, the Politically Incorrect Evangelist. It all comes from John 4. She is the most unlikely contact the world's ever seen. All right, She doesn't check any box. And yet Jesus made a contact out of her. How did he do it? He did it with 17 things. It's a three-part sermon. And, and, and there's a progression you're going to make. And each Sunday, the church has a different action. Sunday number one, they get their bookmarks. And they populate them that week. Sunday two, we pull out our bookmarks. We pray for our contacts. And we're going to start praying every Sunday. Every Sunday, an elder is going to pray. And we're all going to get our bookmarks out. And he's going to pray. And Chris, even to this day, still does. We still do it. We never stop doing that. Okay, it's part of our worship. We're going to pray for our contacts. Number three, okay, now the third Sunday is we're going to ask the questions. I'm going to take my bookmark. I'm going to turn it to the back side. And I'm going to notice there are these categories. I'm going to say, okay, does anyone have a contact that's going through cancer treatments? Raise your hand. And ten people are going to raise their hands. All right. Deacons, pass out the contact cards. And I want you to give me a name and address because we're going to love those people unlike they've ever been loved before. So it's a process. Every week you're adding to it. So uh, eventually it gets to a point where you don't have to say cancer. Dead. You, people know. They, they get it. They get it. Right? But life events. So, here, so we're, we're making progress. So here under contacts now, there are sermons um, that you can preach. And the sermons are located with the PowerPoints. Um, here, one of the people that we want to place on our contact list are the unfaithful. So if you um, could go back five years and write down all the people that have fallen away, right? And they're no longer with you, but they're still in the area and make a list. So we're going to put three or four of those on the list every time it prints. We can't put them all on at one time. You'll get 30 to 70% of them back. One of the card categories is restoration. And we're going to try to restore them using this tool. Visitors. 
All right? Let's show you something right here. All right, there's your visitor training card right there. There's your sermon right here. That's the sermon right there that you preach. There's my video that explains it. Let me introduce to you one of our other new training tools. This training tool is from This is a school of evangelism training card. Now, we've already introduced the first in the series that focuses on the model. Now, what we're going to do is break the model down and have a training card for all the processes involved in contacts and prospects and Bible studies throughout the model. So this training card... So every module has a five-minute video. Some have more than one. That's a very important one. Remember, a church needs three to five visitors per 100 members to grow. Or we're going to keep track of that. The invitation cards will help you increase your visitors, but you've got to get the visitors in your church. That's very, very important. They're the hottest contact you've got. They're baptized at the highest rate. And so, so this website is how you eat the elephant one bite at a time. That, that's basically, when, el, when, when elders, I say, now this, this really helps elders. And they say, they take a, a, a breath. Oh, okay, now that's how I do it. Yeah, you just do one at a time. So the elders and preachers meet every week and they start breaking this down. And they make sure they fill each one of this from house to house, heart to heart, new movers, benevolence, door knocking, invitation cards. Do you remember those invitation cards? There they are. That's, the, that's a good picture of the back of it right there. Okay. And that QR code takes you to your website, invited by uh, Chris uh, Miller, and services we offer. We customize it for you. What do you offer? All right, little bitty card in your wallet, and you leave it for the waitress. You leave it for the bank teller. You leave it for the gas station attendant. You leave it at the post office. You just keep, you just keep handing them out. If you hand out 12,000 of these a week, you're going to get some visitors. It's going to happen. Now, and, and this is how you do it. So here's your training. My training is very short. Every time I train, I keep it short because I was a preacher and I know time is of the essence. My videos are always five minutes. VBS, how do you turn Vacation Bible School into an evangelistic event? Well, I've got some suggestions here. There they are. Here are things you can do to make Vacation Bible School save souls. All right, VBSs are very important. And there's a video that explains it right there. Trunk or treat, backpack drives, graduation banquets, community events, all of it listed right here under contacts. So the, the website is very, very helpful because it allows you um, to, again, piece it together one at a time. Let's go to prospects. All right, here's your prospect list. You download the prospect list. There it is right there. <clears throat> That's the spreadsheet. You track them. That is, you list the people. You track how many cards each week. In fact, let me just open it, and I'll show you what it looks like. So how do you keep track of everybody? Well, you do it like that. It's real simple. You can make a, I have a complicated one if you want it with a lot of formulas, but I like to keep things simple. Name, all right? Sharon Fisher, relationship, friend of Brandy Fleming, description, needs encouragement, address, phone number, date added, week one, 36 cards, week two, 28 cards, Week three, you know, 47, 41 cards. Now we meet together. We know she's ready to be visited, so we're tracking every person. That's the spreadsheet we were talking about earlier. Very important that you track this. If you don't track this, what happens? Nothing. Nothing happens. That's the point. Nothing happens if you don't track this. So all of this stuff right here will help you, again, stay organized, and um, it helps us uh, keep things moving. So that's your prospect list. That's the video that tells you how to do it. Compassion cards. We have several videos for compassion cards because it's such a critical setup. And we talk about how do you set it up. Here's your training. Here's your sermon. I'll, sh I'll show you what the sermon looks like. <clears throat> Our sermons look just like this. Every sermon looks just like this. The author, Adam Fawn, Central Church of Christ. He wrote the sermon for me. There's your introduction. There's your text. There it is. Make it yours, preacher, but you need to preach a sermon on cards and how to do it. So we, we um, provide for you, you know, the mechanism through which you can accomplish it. So all those are your prospecting advice. Let me get down here to Bible studies, all right? So back to the Bible. I just want to bring that up. All right, back to the Bible. Here's your format, 16 by 9, 4 by 3. Well, let's just pull one of them up and look at it. All right, just pull up our 16 by 9. Let's open it up. And so if you're going to teach it as a preacher, you already have, you already have the uh, PowerPoint provided. There it is. 
All right. So now what we're going to do is we're going to introduce it to the church and we're going to preach through back to the Bible book number one. That's the survey. We always ask those questions before we start a Bible study. Yesterday I taught you how to do that. Okay. We're going to go through them one at a time. You can see that the easy done. So we've uh, made some, uh, um, e- make, make it easy to understand and read. So as a preacher, <clears throat> okay, can you do that? Of course. All right. We're just going to fill in the word. Real simple, right? Real simple stuff. So everyone here can be a part of that. And as you train your members, they can participate. They're filling it out in the pews. So this makes uh, the training as easy as we possibly can. So what we want to do is make it simple for the preacher. I do not want the preacher spending hours developing PowerPoints. Now, if, you want to, if, if that's what you just like to do in your spare time, go for it. But if not, these are professionally designed. They look really good. All right, so let's go back to the website right here. All right, uh, we're at Back to the Bible and the training. Let me see if I can enlarge that real quick. Okay, uh, this is the religious survey. How do you do it? How do you ask those questions? And just different models. We have Believe the Bible on there. We have Back to the Bible. We have Does It Matter? Here's Believe the Bible and the PowerPoints for it. All right. So let's go down here to baptisms, and we'll look here. All right, so what do we need to do about baptisms? I taught you some of these lessons already. Let me me get a couple ones. How to close the study. So what do you say in a a Bible study? By the way, let me ask a question. What is the best close in a Bible study? What's the best close? Somebody tell me. What is the best close? Happy days. days. I like that. I like that. All right. I love that. That was good. That's, that's an experienced evangelist. What's the best way to close a Bible study? Here's Bobby Bates. Never close the study. Never close it. That's the best close. You never close the study. You keep the study going. So if you finish back to the Bible and they say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm not sure I'm ready. Oh, it's okay. We're not done. We've got another study next week. You pull out, does it matter, and do it. Hey, i got open Bible. We'll do open Bible study. We'll do it. Whatever. We never stop. I mean, I, I, well, I finished the studies. I guess they're not going to obey. Well, what do you mean you finished? No, you're not finished until they are finished. You keep studying. You never stop. You never stop. Bobby Bates uh, has a couple things. Uh, one of them is um, always anticipate objections. So as you're working with people and you say you're working with a young couple and you get the sense they're living together, that's an objection. Well, you better bring it up. You don't let them do it. You bring it up and you frame it. You frame it and give them an exit strategy. Show them how to fix it. So those are, those are things that in, in how to close the study that we, we talk about. How do you overcome objections? How do you deal with those things, all right? How do you talk to children? Um, Chris, have you ever had a mother with a six-year-old come up to you, okay, and they're crying, right? I mean, it's emotional. It's a no-win scenario for a preacher. All right, so <clears throat> how do you deal with children in baptism? Uh, would you all like to know? Because it, this is, this, I, I learned this from an old soul winner. It works really well. I, I'll, I'll take three minutes and tell you how to do this. All right? So a mother comes to me with children. Uh, a child, child seven, whatever, six, seven years old. She's crying. Uh, you know, he's saying, I need to be baptized. I need to be baptized. And then you got some members, sometimes even elders, that don't know how to handle it. Hey, just baptize them. It's okay. Just baptize them. We don't want to discourage them. Because if you've discouraged them, they'll never be baptized again. And I remember that one person we said no to. And then they were never baptized the rest of their life and you're having this pressure put on your shoulders but you know on the inside I shouldn't be baptizing a seven year old anybody ever been there before all right it's it's a not a good place to be all right here's what an old soul winner taught me hey mom let's sit down come on sit down hey bring your sister over here let's sit down hey James let's sit down we just sit down I say James hey let me tell you a story Y'all ready a story this is I, it works every time Hey, let's, let's pretend just for a minute. Let's pretend. We're going to go get in a car. Let's get in the car. What kind of car are we going to get into? Just talk to them. Get them thinking. Um, okay, get your sister in there too. How old your sister? She's just two? Okay, make sure you put her in her seat, you know. Get in the car. We're going down the road. James, do you know what a drunk driver is? Yeah. I said, we just got hit by one. And we all just died. Every one of us. Uh, hey, James, uh, where's your sister going to go? Oh, heaven. Why? Listen to the answer. Don't help him. He probably can't explain it. He's seven. He can't explain this one. Okay. Uh, maybe he can. 
Probably not. Okay, second one. Uh, where do I go? Where am I going to go? Oh, you're the preacher. You go to heaven. But why? Why am I going to heaven? And see if he can explain that. Hey, James, uh, where are you going? 99 times out of 100. You know what James is going to tell me? Guess what? I'm going to heaven. And, that's, and I looked at, I've done this so many times. I'll look at the mother and I'll say, I look right at it. I said, Mom, James thinks he's going to heaven. I do too. So does God. That's exactly where James is going. James, you're going to heaven. You know, baptism is for people going to hell. And James, one of these days, you'll know. That's how I deal with children. And it works really, really well. I learned that from an old soul winner. It saved me time and time again. It's rare that I get a young person that, that said, no, I'm going to hell. It almost never happens. It's the mama or daddy that don't know how to handle it. And they're pressuring you to do something you know you shouldn't be doing. Okay, if you really want to look at a seven-year-old and tell me they're going to hell, you got a problem. Okay, seven-year-olds are not going to hell; they're going to heaven, and uh, and so we just we have to learn how to handle this. So evangelism um, has a lot of different facets to it. So we talk about children. Um, so here's the new convert stuff right here. This is about uh, uh, the basics, uh, congregational classes, how to set them up, what we use in our curriculum. This is about membership and mentoring. You know, about how important it is to set up mentors to, to, to help that new convert grow and develop. Um, let me give you this one right here. This is called graduation. And uh, so I had, a, I had an elder call me and he said, hey, Rob, he says, uh, he said, we got a problem here at this church. And I said, what is it? He said, we got this huge new convert class. Rob, we got like 20 of them in there. Rob, they won't leave. They won't leave, Rob. Some of them have been in there for two years. We need to integrate them into our adult class, but they won't leave the class. Rob, how do we get them to leave? Now, this is a serious issue because I've had multiple elders ask me this. So I thought for just a minute and I said, graduate them. I said, I want you to have a graduation ceremony in worship. Like after, right after worship, everybody take their seat. We're going to have a graduation ceremony this morning. Bob Smith, come forward. Lee Thomas, come forward. Uh, James Medley, come forward. And when they get forward, let's give them a gift, a graduation certificate, and announce to the church, this, these, these are our new graduates of our new conference class. We're so thankful for their growth and development, and we're looking forward to seeing them next Sunday in the adult class. It solves every problem. It makes it a positive experience. You don't have to go there and tell them you're no longer welcome in the new convert class. That's a bad thing to do. So again, those are some of the things that we have on our website that help you process through the problems. Um, how to deal with moral issues with new converts. So new converts are not you. They don't know what you know. They, they've not been taught what you taught. So they're going to walk in in their miniskirt. They're going to walk in with, you know, um, you know, the cigarette hanging out of their mouth or, you know, whatever it is they're doing. And, they're, and, and you know, the, the members are going to, you know, wince and, uh, and, and, you know, and, and, you know, and you're just thinking, please don't say anything to them, you know, because they, they're, not, they're not you. How do you deal with moral issues? That new converts have. You know they have some, right? So they, just because they're baptized doesn't mean now they're, you know, they're, they're sinless. or they're, I mean, their sins have been forgiven, but they're still struggling. Well, how do you deal with those things? We have several suggestions on how to gently help new converts deal with moral issues. So her name was Teresa. Teresa's a Jersey girl. Teresa wears very short skirts. Teresa wears very low clip blouses. And Teresa, um, she's, she's, a, she's a very interesting person. And... Um, but, but as she walked into the church service for the first time, guess what? She's not dressed appropriately. I mean, not at all. And, um, and I can see the older lady, you know, like this. And some of the guy, you know, guys like this, you know, we're going like this. And so Teresa sits down and immediately, you know, my thought process is, man, we, 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 we got to help Teresa. So how do you help Teresa? Well, this is how I did. Mentors. I did it through mentoring. So what I did is I, I, I went to Teresa. I said, hey, Teresa, I said, we got some videos we need you to watch. It's part of our, your growth. Yeah, I'll watch them. So I gave her uh, Moral Issues by Don Blackwell. It's on World Video Bible School. I said, just watch those videos and tell me what you think. And she did. And she, uh, she calls me. She said, hey, Rob, can, are we going to have lunch Friday? I said, yeah. I said, we're still planning on it. We met her at cookout. She looks across the table at me. She says, uh, hey, why didn't you tell me about that? I said, what? She says, the dress and stuff. She says, uh, I didn't know, Rob, but I grew up in like inner city in Jersey. I, I never even thought about that. She says, you know those dances? You know, I used to go to those dance halls here locally with my husband. 
She said, Rob, let me tell you about Dan Sauls. Nothing biblical goes on inside of them. That's what she told me. Nothing biblical goes on inside of dance clubs. Now she's teaching me. She said, Rob, never go to one. I know you've never been to one, Rob. Don't go because they're not biblical. And now she's telling me about the dance clubs. <laughs> found it very interesting that she knows not to go. I wish our mothers did. I wish some of our families knew. She knows. She knows don't go there. And so how did we do that? Well, we mentored her. We gave her stuff to watch and helped her develop, right? So we're still in that teaching form. And we did it very lovingly, very carefully. Uh, we, we didn't chasten her at the worship service and embarrass her. No one wants to be embarrassed. But people do like to learn. They do want to know. So I, we got several suggestions on how to do that, all right? A growing church. A couple more things. We're about done. Um, here, let me give you just the highlights of a growing church. What does a growing church do? Number one, we strongly suggest a growing church plays the videos. I don't know if y'all do this or not, Chris. Okay, yep. Okay, yep. So, so I would put a video on the screen on a Sunday, and I would watch one video to motivate the church. We have 111 of them. We add one a week. So if your church watches an evangelism video every week, is that going to motivate them? Yes. And you can pick what video you want. Now, watch what I'm going to do, everybody. Have y'all done this already? Let's go to YouTube. All right. Let's go to our playlist. Look at that. <clears throat> Growing church. New converts. Baptisms. All the videos that deal with each subject are right there. So if you're, if you're about to have a vacation Bible school, what would you do? Well, Vacation Bible School will be under contacts. View full play playlist. And let's find it where it says Vacation Bible School. It's out here somewhere. Okay. Vacation Bible School. Somewhere. I may have passed it. Y'all probably see it before I do. Was it? Oh, there it is. Yep. There it is. There it is. There's your, there's your video for Vacation Bible School. So if you're going to have a VBS, play it. If you're going to have a trunk or treat, play it. Pick the video that, what, associates with what you're about to do as a church. And what does that do? It energizes the church. It keeps evangelism. It's just five minutes. It's a five-minute video. That's why our videos are short. We're doing something new. Chris, you don't know about this. We're going to do one-minute videos. And that's our first one-minute video. It's called Evangelism Tips. It's a one-minute video. And those are brand new. We're just about to launch those right there. Okay. And that one's how to save card postage. Because <laughs> I get that question all the time. So I just talk about how to save postage with cards. And uh, so it's a one-minute video now. So I got one-minute evangelism tips. And what I'm trying to say is that we are 116 videos. We're, we're, we're training heavy. We're constantly training, constantly trying to give you what you need to grow. Those are just a few things I hope that will help you. And uh, I hope that that provides um, a little bit of, 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 of clarity as to how a local church sets up this up. Because it is a lot. And, um, but you won't do it in one day. It takes a long time to get that done. Now, there is some additional resources we have. I hope this works because there's one of them I really would like you to see before we close. And I think it's right here. If I can get this. No, that is not it. If I can get this to work, I think you guys will really like this. All right, see if I can bring it up here. Um, Hard for me to see here. I need to change the font color on these. Or I need to let's see the name of the house to have WBBS. I think there it is. That's what it is, right there. That's Bobby Bates. That is Bobby Bates right there. And if I can get this to work right, I want you to see just oh, I just want you to hear him. Because he's, he's one of the greatest soul winners who ever lived. I just want you to hear his voice. This was recorded in the 70s, late 70s, early 80s. So, uh, is it going to play? I was hoping it would. Sometimes I have an issue here. I don't always know what it is. You just can't hear it. Um, I wish you could, but I think you can on your, on your, um, on your device. But that's Bobby Bates. And I would love you just to hear him. He teaches you how to use Back to the Bible. It's really, really good stuff. And if you've not gone through that, we can learn a lot of lessons by listening to some of those old soul winners. Can you take me back to the PowerPoint so I can show a closing slide, Caleb? Let's go back to the PowerPoint. I'll show you all a closing slide. And I'm going to run through these real quick. 
All right, that's where I want you, right there. Take your church membership, multiply it times 10. That's how many contacts you need. You're only going to prospect 10% of those. So if Hatton is 200, that means they need 2,000 contacts. That means they need 200 prospects a year. That means they'll have 20 Bible studies. That means they'll have 18 baptisms. We want 100% of our new converts to remain faithful. We don't want to lose one. Unacceptable to lose any. And we want our church to grow at 10% a year. That's what we're goals. That's our school goals. And we, get, we accomplish that in about 70% of the churches in our school. The, the, the smallest church that's enrolled in our school is around six or eight. All right, we have a lot there in their 20s. They go up to 600. We've never had a church close their doors in this school. Every church we have are helping. They're having some type of you know, growth, or at least they're not, they're not declining. Uh, any questions um, for you guys? Uh, I just wanted to share the website with you uh, because I think that's a very important part of it. Obviously, at Highland Park, the elders, you will get access. The, the, the church will get access. The preachers will get access to it. Chris, you already have access, you and the elders. And um, uh, Travis, I'll be glad to provide you access. You just have to ask me. I, I won't remember. And I'll send you a link and, and give you access to it. Yes, ma'am. I normally like to give it only to the leadership of the church, and the reason is I want them to develop it. I'm not opposed to, any, to y'all getting it. If you want it, I'll give you access because you've sat through my class. I don't mind at all, uh, but it's really designed for the leaders of a church to, to develop. It's a developmental curriculum, for, but I do not mind giving it. In order to get access, you just need to give me your email address and name, and I've got to send you a link so you can get access to it. Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, those are public. Yeah, YouTube videos are all public. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. Good question. You guys have been a great audience. Thank you so much for being a part of our training session. Thank you for those joining us online. Uh, we are the House to House Heart to Heart School of Evangelism. You can contact me at rob at house to house dot com, rob at house t o house to house dot com. And if you would like me to bring this training to your congregation, I would suggest the best way to do that is to email me. And then set me up with a Zoom meeting with your elders so I can overview it with them and they can make that decision. So about 9 out of 10 elderships will say yes <laughs> immediately. They'll say, yes, we want you to come. Um, depending on where you're located, it could be 12 to 24 months before I get there, before our, our team can get there. If you want to do remote enrollment, you can start tomorrow. I mean, remote enrollment is like this. And uh, sometimes smaller churches will select that option. Um, Let's uh, bow our heads and pray. Our Father, we're thankful for this day. We're thankful for uh, Jesus and for his blood and for the church. Father, we pray for the growth of the church. We pray, Father, for um, uh, the souls that are in our communities. Help us to reach them, Father. Uh, and help, help us to love them like, like Jesus loves the world. Father, that we would sacrifice even to our own... Uh, our own um, personal wants and wishes, Father, and our time. And Father, we just pray that we could develop a, a spirit of evangelism in our churches. Father, we pray that the church of Christ will grow. Um, bless us, Father, and keep us in thy care. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you mention the weekly emails? Yes, uh, the weekly emails. Um, again, if you'll, e if you'll uh, that QR code, if you'll use that QR code at the beginning of the PowerPoint, uh, you can get the weekly emails. Absolutely. Absolutely.